This Atari 7800 is in very nice condition. But RF sucks, so we're going to install a Deluxe The Future Was 8-Bit composite mod and add a reversible power socket mod to cut out this bespoke connector. And we'll do it right now. Mark fixes stuff. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented makers designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. Let's take this apart and see what we're working with. The aluminium strip is in really nice condition, so let's be really careful not to scratch it. There are five case screws, two at the back and three at the front. The screws are all the same size and type, so no need to keep them separate. This is UK PAL console. We did a previous video on modding a USA NTSC machine and the process differs a bit. Oops. With the screws removed, we can just lift off the top shell of the console. My wire wrap tool is again pressed into service to straighten the tabs on the ubiquitous Atari RF shielding. Sometimes a tool for one purpose can be unexpectedly useful for another. Because the tool has a flat slot, it straightens the tab as I twist. Winner! I always forget that these two are in here. Removing the shield, we can see a really clean board. We'll be removing the modulator and a bunch of components from here. And then we'll put in the deluxe composite mod kit. We'll change the power input as the original Atari one is a custom affair and hard to find now. Even though 3D printing has made that easier. We'll use this barrel connector that I've filed down a bit. I don't want to cut the case at all so this will really help. Naturally, we'll replace these old electrolytic capacitors whilst we're here to ensure that the console runs for many years to come. Before we can start work, we need to remove the extra shielding on the bottom of the board as well. I gently lever these off with a blunt tool, being careful not to damage the board at all. Atari sure did love a bit of shielding. I actually love the layout of this board, I think it's really functional. These 500k parts for adjusting the colour phase of the 7800 and 2600 portions of the console respectively. And just look at this awesome vintage Fairchild EEPROM with a decorative moulded ridge running the full length of the chip. We'll need to remove and store this modulator. I want these mods to be reversible in the future, so I'll work carefully desoldering the pins. They're located here on the underside of the board. Time to pull out my desoldering gun. The pins are clearing really easily. With the pins loose, we need to remove the actual modulator case from the ground plane of the board. The ground plane is usually a bit of a pain, but for once the solder cleared really easily. I've done these before with the solder sucker and trust me, the desoldering gun is 100 times easier. Et voila, even I was surprised. Off into storage you go. With the modulator removed, we need to remove a few components from the audio video section of the board. We'll start with this adjustable coil at L6, which is responsible for tuning the sound carrier in the RF output. It's easy to find under the board because it's got a massive hole ready to take a tool. 
A bit more hot suction is required and again it's going really well. The coil comes free of the board really easily. We'll pop this with the modulator for storage. Next up we need to remove this transistor at location Q8. It's a 9018 type which is a device specifically designed for amplifying AM FM outputs. Because we removed the modulator it's no longer needed and could actually add noise into our final mod. I'm starting to get a bit suspicious because things are going a bit too smoothly. We'll also store this in the bag with the other components. Time to remove this resistor at location R32. This resistor drops the audio signal down for the old modulator. We actually need to amplify the signal, so this part has got to go. The resistor directly above at R33 pipes any sound from the special pokey chips featured in a few games, so we need to remember to connect these together too. R62 is next for the chop, and this is the video signal itself. Again, this resistor is balancing the video signal, and that will now be done by our main board. Out you come. Don't be difficult now. Into the bag with you. Let's deal with this power port before we install the composite mod. Not only are the original power supplies hard to find, the connectors themselves are really non-standard and fail over time with wear and tear. Unhooking the legs from the board can be a bit tricky, but it will come out in the end. Even though these were keyed connectors, it was still possible to push the connector in reverse. Bag time! To replace the old connector, I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to install my own version of a reversible connector. Having checked the board with a continuity meter, I give it a quick wipe so that I can note the polarity of the pins. I'll make a little sticker later. Terry and Dave get nosy as I pop the pins into place. A dab of Smurf exhaust to hold the pins in place. and we solder our power header pins into the board. Done. We'll return to this after we've recapped the board. There are only three electrolytic capacitors in an Atari 7800, and they're all connected to a big ground plane that steals the heat from your tool and makes it hard to get the old solder flowing. The positive legs of the caps are easy to remove. But those pesky negative cathodes are a pain in the backside. Crud. I knock the heat up on the desolder gun 20 degrees to 350 degrees Celsius, and that helped, but it was still a bit tricky. The hole didn't clear, which will get in the way of our new component later. I usually fix this problem with a fresh blob of solder. The fresh solder gives us a larger thermal capacity on the hole and helps the solder gun to get a good suck on the wire. I'm annoyed by that scratch though. I know it's going to be the same story for this capacitor, and this one as well. Again, that ground plane wants to ruin our day. This time we'll outfox the board by applying a fresh blob of solder onto the joint whilst we're desoldering. And before I can even get some suction going, the capacitor literally falls out of the board. Unfortunately for us, this means that the hole didn't clear again. Oh well, more solder to the rescue.
The first time was a failure, even with fresh solder, but another go with another blob got the job done at last. Phew. The third and final electrolytic capacitor located towards the front of the machine is the last to be removed. Both the positive and negative planes on the board are pretty large here, so I'm taking no chances and going straight in with the fresh solder approach. It pays off on the larger ground plane with a hole clearing instantly. And the smaller positive plane also gives up the goods, allowing us to easily pick the part out of the board. When putting in replacements, always look for markings on the board. This board shows the positive symbol. The plus sign is for the longer positive leg, also called the anode. We'll use some liquid flux here, and we're going to face the same heat problems when installing the new capacitors as when we remove the old parts. This soldering tip is not big enough. Size does matter. So, why am I using it? Well, to demonstrate why you might run into some problems. A small tip doesn't have enough surface area to feed heat into the board quickly. If you waited, then the board will get hot eventually, but by then you've cooked off the flux in your solder and possibly your component is internally barbecued as well. A bigger tip can heat the joint much more quickly and keep the heat local to the solder joint that you're working on. And this is where practice really helps. Knowing your tools and your solder can make painful jobs a bit less awful. Legs clipped and installed. When you buy a new soldering iron, they'll often come with a tiny tip and usually conical, basically pointed. These tiny tips are great for modern surface mount devices where the components can often be the size of a grain of rice. But for retro electronics, you'll often find that you need a larger tool in addition to your tiddler. You can buy a variety of tips for most decent mid-range soldering irons, so don't be afraid to experiment with different sizes. So now the board is recapped. Let's make up the power cable. I'm going to use this DuPont wire because it's already furnished with these handy connectors for our power header. Nothing wrong with being a bit lazy, is there? I intend to mount the power socket non-destructively in an existing case hole on this side of the console. Taking the connectors off the other end of the cable, we set about soldering it onto our socket. But stripping the wire, I start to get a bit nervous. You see, this type of wire is familiar to me. It really doesn't solder very well, never mind how much flux you use. But it's probably going to be okay. Although the dull finish of the tinned wire is not encouraging, and Terry and Dave are giving me knowing looks. Let's just solder it on then. First, I'm sliding some heat shrink tubing down over the wire. Then I insert the wires, ready to be securely attached to the solder tabs. No problem at all. Except that the solder won't take to the tinned wire. It just runs off. One last attempt, and you can see that all the overheating has melted the shrink tubing. So here's the lesson. Some wire is cheap and nasty, and some wires are not meant to be soldered, just crimped. This wire is the latter. Let's use some of my proper wire now and stop being lazy. My only concern with this stuff is that the silicon insulation might be a bit too thick and lustrous to crimp into a connector. A box of decent hookup wire will save you many hours of scavenging and bodging poor solder joints. This is my small DuPont connector crimping kit, 
Unfortunately, my crimping tool is a bit um, rubbish, but we'll get the job done anyway. The inserts have two sets of wings. The square ones are to grip the wire and the triangular ones are to grip the cable sheath. I put the metal insert into the crimper, then I slide the wire in as far as it will go. I ratchet the crimper and then I often have to go back and give it a further squeeze with some small grips. It's annoying, but it might be my lack of skill with the tool. With a bit of gentle persuasion, the connector goes into the housing. Get in there. With the second wire done, we insert that too. This is much better, despite my new crimping skills. And at least the gummy crew approve of me doing the job with proper wire. Soldering with decent wire shows us a world of difference. Because these wires are not joined, we'll pop a couple of larger shrink tubes on them just to keep them tidy. I do like a job to be neat. We'll also need some smaller heat shrink to insulate the power socket tabs. I'm not actually sure where I bought this socket. It has a round face with an offset socket input hole. I bought 10 of them a few years back and this is my last one. With a small amount of filing to make one side a bit flat, they're absolutely ideal for the 7800. Much better. Sliding the shrink tubing down, we use my hot air rework station at its lowest setting of 100 degrees Celsius to pull the insulation nice and tight. If anyone finds these for sale again anywhere, please let me know. I found some recently, but they were slightly too large for the hole. Okay, let's also shrink these to keep our new cable tidy. The idea behind using these jumper headers is that I thought it would be good if the user could switch the polarity of the socket in case they didn't have a suitable supply to hand. It's also one less thing that needs to be glued to the mainboard in order to enjoy this vintage console. The red wire is the centre pin and we'll make sure that that's clear for future users. Because red is centre, and because I want to use a Sega Mega Drive PSU that's centre negative, I'm putting our header on with the red wire on the negative pin. A good fit, but of course we'll need to feed it through the case later. From the outside, due to the size of the socket. This socket fixes in place with a simple nut, meaning no glue required. The gummy crew want to play some games and have told me to fit the composite mod. This small board takes the signals that we've liberated from the board and amplifies them to the appropriate level for composite signal use. It sits right here in the hole vacated by the archive modulator can. It's supplied with a sticky pad, but I'm not sure if that will hold, so we'll double up with some super glue gel. The original masking tape is stuck fast and that's handy because I don't want to glue directly to the board. The gummy crew have kindly brought the cable that we need to attach to the board. This takes the video and audio signals from the board, as well as the 5 volt and ground needed to power the mod. The mod comes pre-tinned and ready to go, but I prefer to cut the wires to length for neatness. Yellow for video. White for audio, although not connected to Pokey Sound yet. And red and black for the 5 volt power feed and ground. A quick date with this stripper and these wires will be ready for tinning, prior to being soldered into our 7800.
I'm using leaded solder because that's what would have been used on the board in the factory. Mixing modern unleaded solder alloys with leaded can cause poor joints and brittle connections. The yellow wire will pick up the video signal from the left hand side of where we removed the resistor at R62. The white wire will pick up the audio, but just from the TIA chip at this point, at the right hand side of R32. And our red 5 volt power and black ground wires will be soldered into the bottom two positions where we desoldered the modulator pins from the main board. And that's the Deluxe Mod wiring installed. Let's pop our nut on the power cable and label it up next. I do love a label maker. When I got this, I labelled everything. Poor cat. I've doubled it so that I can use it as a wrap tag. Hopefully that will be clear enough for people to understand in the future. I feel like a grown up now. Now, coming back to the issue of sound that's supplied through poker chips. It's routed from the cartridge through resistor R33 and we're simply going to use the lead of the existing resistor to bridge these two points. On some consoles, you might find that the native TIA audio is much louder than the pokey music and sound effects. In that case, fit a 6.8 kilo ohm resistor between R32 and the white wire. For now, we'll simply connect the two to enable pokey sound. There are just two vintage games that use the pokey chip, Ball Blazer and Commando. It's time to mount our composite mod. Let's put the lower RF shielding on first. With all the shield tabs in place, we can put the system board into the lower half of the console shell. With the Atari 7800, the controller ports and difficulty switches need to be placed into the front of the case first, and then the board will simply lie down in the perfect position. Just to be a bit tidier, I've made a sticker showing the polarity of the power pins on the board. I think that looks a lot better. Now, I like a pristine slot, and this one looks a bit mucky. We'll clean around the slot, but the contacts inside will also need some attention. This is a custom tool that I made with some thin mylar plastic. It's cut roughly to the shape of the slot, and importantly, it's not nearly as thick as a real cartridge edge connector. I use either J-Cloth or the thicker kitchen paper brands that you can get. Cutting a bit that's the same width as the slot, I then cut it to the right sort of depth and use some masking tape to hold it in place on both sides. With our cleaning cloth secured in place, I then cut into the two slits of the cartridge edge connector. Now this might look a bit janky, but let me show you how well it works. First we need to squirt some contact cleaner onto both sides of our cleaning jig. Now we slowly but firmly push it deep into the slot until it won't slide any further. We gently move it inside the slot to dislodge any surface dirt on the cart slot contacts. An impressive amount of dirt came out of this one.
and build up like this can stop games working. It's important to keep your slot and your carts clean. The fingers in the slot are looking nice and fresh now. With the main board located in the case, we can position and mount the composite mod board. We'll line the mod up with the old RF output hole. Now, a few people have said that the supplied sticky pads come away over time, so I'm going to try reinforcing this one with a smackerel of super glue gel. I don't want to glue directly to the board, so I'm going to glue to this well-adhered masking tape. A bit more gel on top of the pad too. And then place our mod in the centre of the hole. <laughs> it seems I've rather stupidly picked up my spare mod board, so ignore this one. Hmm, it's a bit wibbly wobbly. I don't seem to have put the mod close enough to the edge of the board, so the quad pole jack is a bit tough to get in. I've tried pushing it backwards a bit. Whilst we let the mod board glue set, let's get the power socket mounted. The flattened edge of the socket works really well here and gives a really solid fit to the case. I just fix the nut finger tight and then we can tighten it off with a small pair of grips. Using our own notes from earlier, we put the cable on the power header with the centre pin negative. Let's see how that socket is holding up. No, this will not do. Whilst the position was fine, the socket was not stable enough for my liking, so let's take a different approach. I'm going to add a fresh piece of tape to the board and glue the board straight onto that. I want a barrier between the board and the glue. Although masking tape is used because it comes off easily when doing DIY, when it's left for a long period, it sticks fast to surfaces, and I made that mistake painting once. Now that is a much better position for the rear hole. We'll let that set properly now. I'm off for dinner. After a big meal, the socket had set rigid. So rigid, in fact, that I could move the main board by using the cable. Happier with the result than before, I put the connector plug into the mod board. Let's put the shielding back on for a quick test. I wonder if this is me being overconfident. You'll notice a few cutouts in the top shielding. These are for adjusting those colour phases for the 2600 and the 7800 sides of the console. The lower one is for 2600 games. The one above it is for 7800 titles. The hole on the left is for tuning the audio carrier on the RF signal, but good luck with that because we took it out earlier. I'm using my Sega Mega Drive PSU with a centre negative tip and about 14 volts no load. Pressing the power button shows a very welcome green LED. The Atari 7800 console has a built-in copy of Asteroids, and the composite is looking really good. Next I'll test the 2600 cartridge to see if the colour phase needs tweaking. Why does this game remind me of something else? Power on shows that the 2600 side of the console is colourful and working as well as can be expected for composite on an LCD panel. OK, time to put this back together, polish it all up and play some games. I hope you're enjoying this video. Mark Fix's stuff is driven by its patrons and without them I couldn't make the content that I do. If you'd like to become a patron and get ad-free access to videos and behind the scenes posts, please visit patreon.com forward slash stuff. Every pledge helps me to create more videos and I'll have lots more ideas in the pipeline.
With our pal Atari 7800 working, it's time to do some serious sprucing up. Although this is already a good looking unit, it still has that aged look to the plastic. By buffing it with this, we can get a nice look to the console. This product is a kind of semi-opaque dark grey oil. The trick is to layer it on thinly. It covers small scuffs and minor plastic discoloration without looking fake. Don't forget to buff around your slot. For the moulded black grill, I chose to use a soft brush loaded with the black restoration product. It's immensely satisfying to see the richness of the colour restored and using a brush really helps to get into the textures of the case. I lightly went over the rest of the console using the brush as well and I think it makes a real difference. To bring up the shine of the aluminium strip, I like to use a lightly oiled cloth. Here I'm using a dab of 3-in-1 oil on a lint-free microfiber cloth. Once it's polished in and the excess is wiped away, it gives a pleasing look I think. What do you use? So here we have it, a beautiful retro classic brought up to date to be used in the modern age. I know this has been a long journey, but I hope we've all learned a few new things along the way. Now, after all this work, it would be crazy to not play some games, I think. New mod connected. Power in the port. and using my Mega Drive pad to Atari 7800 adapter that I made in a previous video, we're ready to play. Oh, I almost forgot to show you that I labelled the power port as well. The first thing that I played was the built-in version of Asteroids. For a game that came with the system, it's surprisingly addictive, and I played far longer than I would have expected to. Next was one of my favourites, Gallagher. I love this game so much. I think that the 7800 had really great graphics for the time. Some people complained that the sound was the same as for the 2600 unless the cart used a pokey chip, but it really didn't detract from the games for me. Defender 2 is pretty similar to Defender um, 1 but the game really shifts around quickly and for a 2600 title it's got a good feeling of inertia. Most people know the Atari Arcade wireframe game Battlezone, but the 2600 home version has weirdly gone for field graphics. It's still a ton of fun though. I want to say a huge thanks to my amazing Patreon supporters appearing on the screen right now. They are fantastic and make these videos happen. If you'd like to join them on the screen here, visit patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff. Thank you all so much for your amazing support. Whilst you're here, why not take a peek at one of my other videos? 